You've heard of the Shekinah glory, right? Do you even know what that is? We'll find out in this week's Watchmen video broadcast. <laughs> Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. So, the Shekinah glory is going to come down, right? I've heard that for many years. First time I heard that, I was in Bible college in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, on Christian radio, there's a lot of charismatic slash word faith uh, radio stations out there, or there were in the 80s. And the first time I heard the word Shekinah glory, I'm going, what is that? Never heard that. I thought maybe that's the, you know, the, the big glory of God, not the little glory of God, the Shekinah glory. And in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, that word Shekinah, it seems like I've seen that someplace, but I just couldn't quite put my finger on it. But I knew that I had never really read it in the Bible. Some say that the Shekinah glory is that cloud that is in the Holy of Holies, you know, where the Ark of the Covenant is. Let's, let's clear some things up and let's clear this mess up using Scripture. I've never even heard of a place or read of a place in the Bible called the Holy of Holies. I've heard people say that, but I never read that in the Bible. Just to, so you understand, the holy place is where the table of shoe bread and the candlestick is in the tabernacle. Then you have the veil, you have the altar of incense, then you have the veil, then you have this 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits room where the Ark of the Covenant rests. That is what the Bible refers to as the most holy place. I don't even know what holy of holies means. It's the most holy place, meaning that there is no place more holy than the most holy place, because that's where the pillar of cloud rested on the Ark of the Covenant. It was God's presence among the children of Israel. And, and we're going to see that in the scriptures. You know, we've been studying clouds here for the last two Watchmen video broadcasts. Uh, in particular, the cloud where Jesus is going to appear in the clouds at his second coming. We talked about how Mary wrapped him in the swaddling clothes. That was at his first coming. But his second coming definitely is associated with that coming in the clouds. So let's start there in the scriptures and we're going to move down to our understanding of where this Shekinah glory came from. And you're going to find out, as I did, where it was in the back of my mind, the word Shekinah. I knew I had seen it somewhere. You're going to find out where I saw it growing up as a child in this area called Festus slash Crystal City, Missouri. But let's go to the scriptures. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I love this verse because, number one, it declares 
that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, not Aleph Tav. He's not Hebrew now. He's Greek. It's a new covenant with a new language. And he is the mediator of that new covenant. And he is the first and last of the Greek language. That's Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending. And he is God Almighty. That's something that the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and the Hebrew Roots cults and everybody else, that's something they have the huge hang up on. Jesus is not God. Oh, yes, he is. He is God Almighty. He is those things. And he's coming in the clouds. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. That's Revelation 12, Revelation chapter 6. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. I love it. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Notice I have these key phrases underlined. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And these are verses that we used in our first episode of the Watchman video broadcast dealing with clouds. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm trying to set up where we're going in understanding um, the symbolism of clouds, the fact that Jesus and the sign of Jesus appearing is that he is coming in the clouds. And we're trying to set up this idea of what is Shekinah? Is, it, is Shekinah Jesus, the glory of the Lord in the clouds, is Jesus the Shekinah glory? No, absolutely not. And if you have said that, if you have heard that, and, and I just want to help you out. I've been in fundamental Christian services all of, or nearly all of my life. And I have heard good men of God, good men, solid men of God use the term Shekinah glory. I've heard a lot of pastors. I've heard a lot of people say that. I, there's, it's written on a lot of websites. It is talked about by a lot of... I did some history on this. This goes all the way back in some cases to the 1600s where scholars were writing about Shekinah glory. But my problem is where did they get that from? And I'm going to show you in a little bit. They didn't get it from the Bible. Absolutely, they didn't get it from the Bible. So I don't want to sound like I'm the know-it-all and everybody else is wrong and therefore you have to follow me and don't follow anybody else. Because again, I have heard good Christian men talk about Shekinah glory. But you kind of understand that in Christianity, we, we tend to follow people and we tend to parrot what it is that other preachers say. And when you ask them, where did you get it from? Well, I heard other preachers say it. You ask them, where did you get it from? I heard other preachers say it. Nobody can really reliably pin down where exactly they heard Shekinah. They just have always heard it. And in some cases, they've said it. So, I don't want to necessarily just point a finger at a pastor or an individual who has been led to believe that the Shekinah glory is Jesus or the glory of the Lord in the clouds or the glory cloud itself. I don't want to accuse anybody unduly of that. But I actually know where that came from and I'm going to share that with you today. And once you know it and understand it, well, it'd be, you, you never hear me say, oh, the Shekinah glory came down, unless I'm talking about what other people said. So anyway, these verses we've used before, and we're setting up this idea of the glory of the Lord, Jesus, appearing in the clouds. 
uh, Revelation chapter 1, Matthew chapter 24, he sets that up in the context of Christ is, the sign of Christ appearing is that he's appearing in the clouds. And when he does that, he's, the trumpet's going to sound, he's going to send his angels to gather together his elect. Now, if you take that, compare it with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, they both talk about trumpets. So I think there's a connection between the blowing of the trumpets and the gathering together of God's elect when Jesus appears in the clouds. And then, of course, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Exodus 16, you have Genesis with 50 chapters and add Exodus and its first 16 chapters to that, you get 66. It's the number of books in the Bible. And it just so happens in the 66th chapter of the Bible, you have the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. You have the introduction uh, to the Israelites of the bread that comes down from heaven. And Jesus said later on, I am that bread that came down from heaven. But when the Jews looked at it, they used the Hebrew word manna. What is it? Because that's what manna means. What is it? They had no idea. They didn't have a clue. The veil was over them at that time. Just like the veil of Moses over his face. They did not have any idea that what they were looking at was a representation of the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, he's always hidden. In the New Testament, he's revealed. So that's why they looked at it and didn't know what it was. We, however who know the truth and have the mysteries revealed to us, we look back, I see in Exodus 16, 66 chapter of the Bible, that you have a symbol of the Bible revealed, which is the bread that comes down from heaven. Where did our Bible come from? And if you say men, you're wrong. If you say the Catholic Church, then you're twice as wrong. If you say it came down to us from heaven, you're right. Exodus chapter 16, verse 9, And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. See, I like that picture. The rainbow appearing in the cloud. Genesis 9, the rainbow in the cloud in the day of rain. God said, When I bring a cloud over the land, I'll set my bow in the cloud. And that's going to be the sign. Do you get that? The sign of the Son of Man coming is he's going to appear in the clouds. Here in, he's, in Exodus 16, he's a, the glory of the Lord is appearing in the clouds. Ezekiel 1 tells us that the bow in the cloud in the day of rain is like the glory of the Lord. In Genesis 9 says the bow in the cloud is the token of God's covenant. And it all, everything about that points you to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All right? And I'm going to throw in an extra verse here that I haven't used yet dealing with clouds it's from the book of Hebrews because I think Hebrews then actually gives us sort of a clue as to what exactly those clouds that you see in Exodus 16, Genesis chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 1, Matthew 24, Revelation 1, what those clouds actually are. And remember, when, when Jesus appears in the air, the Bible says we're going to appear with him. We are his body right? So Hebrews chapter 12 gives us, I think, a clue as to exactly what those clouds are that Jesus appears in. Hebrews 12 verse 1, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Stop right here. Do you see it now? Hebrews 11, let me go there. Hebrews 11, they call the Faith Hall of Fame. We have all these great names from Bible history. We have uh, Abel, starting with Abel. We have Enoch, who was translated, right? We have Noah, 
Abraham, Sarah, we have uh, Isaac, Jacob, we have, once again, we have Abraham, uh, Isaac, we have uh, Jacob and Esau, Joseph, Moses, uh, Moses again, and then it mentions Gideon, Barak, not Obama, uh, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and of the prophets, all of these people who did one thing, and that is they all believed what God said. They lived by faith because the just shall live by faith. So think of the clouds, the cloud of witnesses. And what are they all testifying? What did, what would Moses testify of? Jesus. What would David, who would David testify of? Jesus. Who would Abraham testify of? Jesus. Who would, who would, uh, who else is in this list? Samson. Who would he testify of? He would testify of Jesus because Samson is a type of, of the, the mighty man of God who sacrificed himself to save the Israelites and to destroy his enemy simultaneously. And it all testifies of Jesus. You and I, our whole life should be a testimony of Jesus Christ. Like Paul said, you are our epistle written um, you know, and known of men not in stony tables, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So we ourselves who live by faith are those who witness and testify of Jesus Christ. So Jesus appearing in the cloud, surrounded by clouds, clothed with the cloud. I believe that the Bible's telling us that those who live by faith the witnesses of faith and of the goodness of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, that we are the cloud of witnesses where Jesus is in the midst of it. It's like the glory of the Lord in the cloud. You get it? So picture all of the saints, all of us, gathered together like clouds. See, clouds are not made of a singular substance. They're made of individual little droplets, tiny, tiny droplets of water. And if it was just one droplet of water, you wouldn't see it. It's like seeing, you can see mist and fog and clouds because the droplets of water have all come together. But just one little tiny micro whatever of water, you would never see it. But we all get together, then you can see it. And the, that's what the clouds are. It's all of us together testifying of Jesus Christ. He is the one that we all say the same thing. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our God. He's our judge. He's our creator. He's our all and in all. Amen. I love it. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that previous verse, Exodus 16, where it was the glory of the Lord appearing in the clouds, and of course Exodus 16, 66 chapter of the Bible, there are 66 books in the Bible, so it's a picture of the Bible, right? And here we have in Hebrews 12, we are the cloud of witnesses who Jesus appears in the midst of, and he is the author of our faith. Where does our faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Who wrote the word of God? Jesus did. Who wrote our faith? Jesus did. He's the author of it. And he comes appearing in the cloud of witnesses. Amen? I love it. Exodus 19. This is the story. This is right before the 70th chapter of the Bible. And in the 70th chapter of the Bible, you have the first record of 
God speaking from heaven, the Ten Commandments. So in Exodus 19, this is the preparation for that where God is going to come down to meet with his people. And Moses is going to ascend up. You get that? Exodus 19, 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. So here we have the promise. Moses is going to gather everybody together. And God says, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. And it just seems like every time God is setting this, he's establishing this idea that when he comes, he's coming in a cloud. So in verse 14, the same chapter, Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. That's a type of having their sins forgiven. Now they're clean. Now they have the robes of righteousness on. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Got to stop right here. That's a time prophecy. Here's A.D. 1. Jesus comes the first time. Uh, A.D. 33. That's when he's crucified. So a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So 1,000 years, one day. 2,000 years, two days. So we've gone past the year 2,000. It's 2019 now. Um, when, what year is the Lord going to come back? Don't ask me. Okay, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that I want to know. I like it best that I don't know. That way, we're always ready. For when the Lord, does, he's already picked out the day, the hour, the year that he's going to come. We just have to be faithful until then. That's not hard. So anyway, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. That's Second Peter uh, over in the Psalms. A, a day in thy sight or, or a thousand years in thy sight or as yesterday, David said. So we have two witnesses establishing a day equals a thousand years. So be ready against the third day. For on the third day, the Lord's going to come down in the clouds. So two days. We're nearing the end of two days, 2,000 years. We're about ready to step into the third day, which would be the seventh day from the creation. Pretty interesting. So I think that very soon, in a matter of years or months or days, the Lord's going to come down again in the clouds. All right? Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. In other words, be pure. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and, and I want you to remember that, and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud. Remember what he said in Matthew 24, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. Think about that. The whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, think of Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. I love that. that if, you don't, if you don't see a picture of the rapture there, what's wrong? Because I see it there. You have the Lord coming down in a cloud with the trumpet sounding. And Moses ascending up the mountain. Let me show you another picture of that. Uh, Matthew, where is it? Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So here Jesus is on the mountain, and his disciples coming up like that. He's going 
we're going up one of these days. Right? So anyway, God talking to Moses, God appearing to Moses, Lord coming down in a cloud, the trumpet sounding, Moses and the people coming up. I think it's just like Matthew chapter 24. Exodus 24 verse 16, as Moses is up on Mount Sinai now, here the Lord's going to appear to him again. And look at what it says. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So it's like I said earlier in chapter 19, you have... He said, be ready against the third day. And I said, the third day comes from Jesus coming the first time to Jesus coming the second time. That would be the third day since Jesus' first coming. But it's also the seventh day from the creation. And that's what you see here. So, once again, God is giving this sort of time prophecy that at the end of the second day or the end of the sixth day from the creation that would be the third day from Christ coming the seventh day from the creation either way by the way let me give you this pure bible search software download it windows linux mac install it if you haven't already type in the phrase third day what you're going to find is it's exactly 52 times in 48 verses of the King James Bible. And then type in the phrase seventh day. You clear that out, type in seventh day. You'll find that it's 52 times in 48 verses. Exactly the same amount of time as the third day is. They're both from a different reference point, beginning point, but they're both referencing the exact same day. Hallelujah. And they're both mentioned the exact same number of times in the King James Bible. An accident? You can believe that if you want. I don't know. So anyway, we have the seventh day. We have the Lord coming down. What other significant event in the Bible takes place on the seventh day? Joshua chapter 6. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city. Remember, we're compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. And compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the, there it is, the trumpets. That's Exodus 19, Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. Blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. You see that? The shouting takes place as the trumpets are blowing on the seventh day. And the seventh day is when the Lord appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai after six days and he was covered with a cloud. Think of it like this. The cloud always, especially a thick cloud, it always separates us from God because the glory of God, if it was released on us, if we saw it, it would kill us, right? So God does us a favor by concealing himself with the cloud. There in Exodus 24, you see in verse 16, you see that he's covered the mountain or covered himself with a cloud for six days but on the seventh day, he now is going to reveal himself. And what he's going to do is going to show Moses his back parts. That's a little bit later on, but that's the idea behind it. Okay? So after six days, after 6,000 years from the creation, the Lord Jesus is finally going to come down and reveal himself to all mankind everybody. I believe that the day that the Lord appears in the air, that every eye shall see him. Everybody who has an eyeball 
is going to see Jesus in the air. And I think, just a guess, I think they're going to know who that is. At least, I think I know. I know I'm going to going to know who that is. All right? Exodus. I like this one. When we're going to, when um, Moses sets up the tabernacle and when Solomon built the temple, in both of those occurrences, as soon as it was, all the work was done, God then decided to come down and glorify that tabernacle with his blessing. Come down and bless it himself with his appearance in there. And his appearance, guess what? Was in the cloud. Exodus 40, And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate so Moses finished the work. Then in verse 34, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward on, in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journey. So, we know that Moses got the instructions for building this tabernacle from God himself, and God showing him the example that was in heaven. So God is, has his temple in heaven and he instructs Moses to build it. And when he does, God comes down, fills it with the cloud and the glory of the Lord shows up there. Now, notice that in this reference here in the Bible, King James Bible, it talks about a cloud and the glory of the Lord. At no time does it ever mention Shekinah doesn't say that here. Well, maybe it says it somewhere else. Well, okay, well, we'll look around here in a little bit. But in this tabernacle, God blessed it himself with his visible presence, the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. This also was done when Solomon erected his temple in his day, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 6, And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord into his place, that's the throne of God, the mercy seat, under the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without. And there they are unto this day. Let me stop right here and explain that. What they did was that Moses, or excuse me, Solomon built this temple. And then when the, the, there was four Levite priests, remember, that carried the Ark of the Covenant. The four represent the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because that's, you have Jesus being the mercy of God. It's his blood sprinkled on there. So, and the Ark of the Covenant represents salvation because of the mercy seat. God forgives all of our sins. So you have the four Levite priests carrying that in there, and they set it in the most holy place. Not holy of holies. Most holy place. They set it down, and the God had instructed Moses that those staves that were in those rings that carried the Ark of the Covenant, they were to never, ever be taken out. So what the priest did was they set the ark in there and they pulled the staves just enough so that they stuck out through the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So that there was, I guess, proof that the ark was still back there for whatever reason. But if you were outside of the holy place, you couldn't see it. They weren't sticking out that far. That's what that means, I think, so far. So verse 9. 
There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass, I love it, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now, I want you to get this picture. Now, twice, twice, the Bible has told us that when the glory of the Lord came to this tabernacle and to the temple, both times, no one could come into the tabernacle or into the temple. Why? Because of the cloud and the glory of the Lord that was in the cloud. Now, you have people all the time bragging about how the Shekinah glory came down. The Shekinah glory came down. Oh, the Shekinah glory came down. And what they are meaning by that is the glory of the Lord like what came in the tabernacle and the temple. Well, I'm not sure what they're thinking because when the glory of the Lord came into the temple, nobody, not Moses, not Solomon, not even the Levite priest could stand in the presence of Almighty God. You see, it's called the most holy place for a reason. It's that we are sinners, unclean, undone. And when you have the full force of the glory of the Lord, not even Moses could go into the tabernacle of God when the glory was in there. So I think some people just brag and boast about a Shekinah glory, like God favors them somehow above everybody else. I don't know, but it just doesn't sound right to me. This whole thing about Shekinah. Because I'm not seeing it here in the scriptures, even yet. Let's move on. Leviticus chapter 16. The Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. So they got in trouble. They offered strange fire. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Verse 13, he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Now, God seems to be making it once again abundantly clear that when God shows up in the tabernacle in the form of the glory of the Lord in the cloud, he's making it so abundantly clear that his presence there is so mighty and so powerful and so full of terror to those around that he doesn't want anybody approaching the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place while he's there. Not even Aaron could go in there any time he wanted. He was only allowed to go in one time per year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. Other than that, that was it. So God's making it clear. Don't Tell Aaron, don't come in here at all times. My glory is in here, and he'll die. So again, I think people like to brag about the Shekinah glory coming down. And I don't think they understand that the full force of God's glory among men, man can't handle it. No way. Now, I like verse 13 of this because uh, of the connection with the cloud of incense. Once again, we have, I like this. Jesus is going to appear in the clouds. We have the cloud of witnesses of all the saints, all those who live by faith. And it says here in verse 13 that it's the cloud of incense 
that covers the mercy seat that is the cloud that his glory appears in. What does that incense represent? I like this. Revelation 8, verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it in the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake, four things, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. You see a connection here. There's a lot of connections here. Number one, the Bible's telling you, if you take that passage from Leviticus 16, 13, and then Revelation 8, 3, and put it together, the cloud of incense that covered the mercy seat, where the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud, the glory of the Lord was appearing in the cloud of incense. What does that incense represent? Well, twice here in Revelation 8, he says the incense represents the prayers of the saints. Do you, see, do you get that? You see, I do believe that the glory of the Lord is always there present when God's people pray. See, incense is not like, oh, cigarette smoke or marijuana smoke. Cigarette smoke, marijuana smoke stinks. Ugh, hate it. Meanwhile, incense is a sweet smoke. It's very pleasant to the smell. I even like the smell of a just a normal wood fire, like a campfire or a wood stove. I grew up with a wood stove or a fireplace. I think that's a sweet smell, right? So we have this sweet odor come, and which direction does it go? Which direction do our prayers go? You see it? Here we have Christ the Lord appearing in the cloud. The cloud is, he's compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. And here we have the cloud of incense that's covering the mercy seat where God sits, covering God up. And here we have that incense as a representation of the prayers of the saints. Man, I love that. All right. So that cloud, that smoke cloud, that incense cloud is where the glory of the Lord is. There's a different kind of smoky cloud that rises up from a different source. We're not going to touch on it this time, but I think it's relevant in understanding where the Antichrist comes from. You may make that connection. You may not. We'll get to it a little bit later on. Not today. We'll get to it later on, though. But anyway, back here in Revelation chapter 8, when this cloud of incense appears and comes up before God, one of, the, one of the priest angels in heaven takes a, a censer and fills it with the fire from the altar in heaven, casts it to the earth. Thunderings and lightnings. Remember what happened on Mount Sinai? Thunderings, lightnings, a cloud. The ground shook. And at this time here, when this happens, the seven trumpets are going to sound. Remember in, in uh, Exodus 19, when the glory of the Lord came down in a cloud, the ground shook, the sound of the trumpet. On the seventh day, the glory of the Lord came to Moses in a cloud. On the seventh day, they sounded the trumpets and shouted. The walls of Jericho fell. You're starting to see a, a connection here with all of these occurrences in the Bible. Now, look at Psalm, I like Get ready for this one, okay? I like this one. I keep saying it, but I like what I'm doing here. Psalm 18, verse 11. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed. Hailstones and coals of fire. We just read that from Revelation chapter 8. The Lord also thundered in the heavens... Revelation 8, Exodus 19, and the highest gave his voice, 
hailstones and coals of fire. There it is, Revelation 8, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So, Psalm 18, I think, is tied in with Exodus 19, um, Matthew 24, Revelation 6, Revelation 8, the sounding of the trumpet, because here the Bible's telling us that between us and God is thick clouds and darkness. Thick clouds separating us from the glory of God. Because remember, if the glory of God came on us in our current form, it would kill us. We would like dissolve instantly at the glory of the Lord. Kind of like that special effect in like Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they open the ark and all these devils come flying out, everybody melts, right? Okay? Listen, when God shows up, who can stand, right? So, the clouds are separating us from God. You see that? Now, we know... Take a look at this picture that there are, I like this. My little son, Matthew, well, my little son, he's big now, but when he was little, he used to look at the clouds and how the sun would be behind the cloud and those rays of sunlight would be coming down. And my child, you know how the mouths of babes, right? My little child would say, Mom, that's God's power, right? That's God's power, right? And, you know, we'd be wiping tears in her eyes. Yes, son. Okay. He got it. He understood the rays of light behind the clouds were God's power, his glory, right? So look at this picture again. Clouds between us and the glory of God. And we know there's clouds in the sky. Did you know there's clouds above the clouds? There's clouds above the first heaven, clouds in space. Take a look at this. Those are called nebula, and the word nebula, I think it's a Latin word, it means clouds, bright clouds, clouds that are in the second heaven. Here's another picture separating the glory of God from us here on this earth. I love it that we have, we finally have a telescope in space that can see things that man has never seen before. So it can see things that Psalm 18, 2 Samuel 22, he made pavilion, darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. He even put clouds in space to separate us from him. And we didn't know it until we put a telescope in orbit above the heights of the clouds here on this earth so that we could still see that there's clouds in space between us and God. And I could look at these nebula pictures all day long. But I have other things to do. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art my servant. O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. Look at this, verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me for I have redeemed thee. What does he mean, I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions? Well, number one, I believe that this is a reference to the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, he comes the first time, Mary wraps him in swaddling clothes, that's the clouds, the swaddling band of the earth. Second coming, he's coming in the clouds. In Genesis 9, he said, when I bring the cloud over the land. Uh, Ezekiel 1, the bow that is in the cloud the day of the rain is the image of the glory of the Lord, the likeness of the glory of the Lord. 
So I think this is a reference, number one, that when God brings this cloud over the land and Jesus appears in that cloud, that that is the time that God is going to redeem Israel from all her sins and all her transgressions. Because he says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. But I also think that it has a reference to the reason why God came down in the tabernacle in a cloud and rested on the Ark of the Covenant because the Ark of the Covenant was also called, or let's say the mercy seat was placed upon the Ark of the Covenant. And that mercy seat, Aaron the high priest went in one time a year, that's all he was allowed because of the glory of the Lord would kill him. And he would go in, he would take the blood, and he would sprinkle it seven times on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. And the cloud was on that. So the atonement for our sins and the sins of Israel was because of the mercy seat, and it was the glory of the Lord in the cloud that was blotting out the transgressions of the sins of Israel. That's kind of what I think that that's a reference to, the glory of the Lord, Jesus, or God appearing in the cloud, and the cloud covering up all their transgressions. And I think that that's coming to the people of Israel one day very soon, hopefully very, very soon. All right? Now back to Numbers chapter 9. I'm going to use this to set up this uh, idea of Shekinah and where it comes from. And we're not going to be able to really get all the way into it this week because I have a lot to cover about the Shekinah. So much, it's at least another hour to talk about this. But I'm going to set it up this week. Numbers chapter 9 verse 15. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle. And of course, then their sins were covered as well. Namely, the tent of the testimony, and at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always, the cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. And verse 18, at the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle, many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. And so it was. When the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was, when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Now, I have used this illustration, number one, in my own life. Number two, to help other people who are trying to discern the will of God. And I've run up against this several times myself. Am I doing what God wants me to do? You know, I, I tell the testimony of this ministry, how it got started as a result of, in 2008, me wrestling with God. I spent three days in my office fasting and praying I would break the fast at even time and go back into fast the next day. And I did this three days. And I wrestled with God and I told God that. I said, I, I, I want you to bless me. I want you to bless what I'm doing, but I want to be doing what you want me to do. And I tried to come up with ideas, the things I could do in the ministry, things I do for the church. None of them, none of them worked. I'd write it down. No sooner I'd write it down, I'd go, that's stupid. It won't work. Crumble it up, scratch it out, write something else down. And I did that for three days. And I finally resigned and I said, God, I don't care what you do with me as long as you do it. And so God gave me relief from the fast 
But then like two weeks later, I'm fasting again because I, I still had no peace about anything that I was doing. I fasted one day and God said, okay, I'm going to bless you. And so I'm like Jacob, you know, I'm not going to release you until you bless me. And God said, okay, I'm going to bless you. And it wasn't too long after that that I woke up one day and I had the idea for this broadcast, the Watchman video broadcast doing the very first one. Believe it or not, I already had a web space with video capability, video hosting capability, and I had a camera sitting in front of a green wall and I had no idea what I was gonna do with it. So when God gave me the idea for the Watchman, I'm going, I can do that. It's like easy, everything's already in place. I had already learned how to put, you know, this background here behind me. It's, it's not real, okay? It's a computer-generated background. I'm actually sitting in front of a green wall. And I already had that in place, and I'd learned how to do it, but I had no idea what I was going to do with it. And then God gave that idea to me. And here's what I'm going to say to you. With the Israelites, knowing when to leave and knowing when to stay, it was, it was very simple the glory cloud was there to lead them. That was the purpose of it. Always follow the cloud, always do, okay? And the cloud, when it was there, they would get up in the morning, they'd look over to the tabernacle because they all camped around the tabernacle. So they'd look at the tabernacle, if the glory cloud was there, what that meant was, go about your business. I like what God says here. He said, take your rest. We're not going anywhere, take your rest. I believe God was very good to the people of Israel. I believe that he, they traveled a while and then they rested a while. God took, it's like a shepherd knowing his sheep. Sometimes you know when to lead them. Sometimes you know when to let them rest. So God would let them rest. 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 Okay? So when the cloud then, when they would get up and they saw the, either day or night, they saw the pillar of cloud like over on the next hill, that meant to the Israelites, start packing everything up. To the Levite priests, they all had instructions on what to do with the tabernacle, how to pack it up, and who went first. That was even determined by God. God had an order for everything, and God would wait on them as they packed up and got everything ready. And when they were ready to march, God started moving, and God never left them, ever. And I always say to people, when it comes to knowing the Lord's will, God does understand that we don't see past a few seconds into the future. We don't have that ability. We don't even know from one second to the next whether we're going to have a heart attack or a meteor is going to fall down from the sky and kill us or a car is going to run into it or what. We don't know. God always does. God already knows your future, and he already knows what he's going to do with you. So in one way, you don't really even have to worry about being in the will of God because God has controlled and worked your life every day of the week up until this very moment. Everything that's happened to you has been the precise plan of God. It's been exactly what God wants. You say, even the bad stuff? Well, of course, even the bad stuff. Because by that, we learn. We learn ways that we shouldn't do them anymore. We made mistakes, right? Even in those mistakes, God was in them. God let us make them so that we'd learn by them. Maybe he needed to, we needed to do something so he could chasten us, so he could say, don't do that anymore, right? It's like raising a child. Children. Children don't worry from day to day about how their life is going to turn out. They're children. And we, compared to God, are children. And if you would learn to trust God. How many days ahead does he give us to worry about? Just one. And that's today. So... I think knowing and understanding the will of God is 
Just that simple. When God moves, God will move you. And when God wants to stay, you'll stay. If God wants me in Kenya, I'll be in Kenya. If God doesn't want me in Kenya, I've already found that out. If God doesn't want me in Kenya, I even had a planned trip to Kenya, was at the airport and got turned away. And I knew it was the will of God. I just didn't understand why, but I knew it was the will of God. And it's just that simple. So if you'll learn the simplicity that is in Christ, and a lot of it is waiting on the Lord. You see, what I did was I waited on the Lord. I waited for God to show me what to do. And boy, was God faithful. That first Watchman broadcast with no advertising, nobody knew about it, put it out there, first weekend, 500 views. I, my jaw dropped. How in the world did that happen? That was God. And now, 10 years later, two FM radio stations, live streaming of all of our services, people all over the world watching this broadcast, watching the things that we do here. I just waited on the Lord. And He led and He blessed. That's my advice to you. Wait for the cloud. Follow the cloud. That's what it's there for, to lead us, to guide us. That's where God's glory is. Follow it, all right? Now, Shekinah. Let me show you this. Because uh, some say that this cloud that we're talking about here in the tabernacle was the Shekinah glory, the glory cloud, right? Let me show you what the Bible says. The word Shekinah, number one, is not in the King James Bible translation. The word Shekinah is not even in the NIV or the New American Standard or the Christian Standard or the English Standard or any of the other standards or the news or the whatever new Bible comes out. The word Shekinah is not in any of them. And then some would say, and I've had them say, well, it's in the Hebrew. No. Let me show you something. There's a word in Hebrew called shakan. And it's a masculine verb. You remember from school, right? The difference between a noun and a verb. This is a noun. It's a thing, a person, place, or thing. A verb is what the noun does or performs. Shakan is a, let me show it to you. Shakan, there it is, is a verb, an action thing. Some, it, it's a doing word. And here's an example, Exodus 24, 16. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. This is from blueletterbible.org. You can check me out. The glory is the Hebrew word kabod of the Lord, Yehovah, yod heh vah the tetragrammaton. And then you have the word abode, which is shakan upon Mount Sinai. Shakan is a verb. Shekinah is a noun. And it's a feminine noun. So, when people say Shekinah is in the Bible, they're wrong. Shekan is a verb, and it means to abide, God abiding with his people, and it's always in the masculine. The word Shekinah is a noun, and that's feminine. Let me show you a source on that. The idea of Shekinah first shows up in the Jewish Targums, which are paraphrases of the Old Testament. Since the Jews saw God as having nothing to do with his creation, that he could not touch his creation, there was provided for him a mediatrix. Does that sound familiar? The feminine force they called Shekinah. Any place in the Bible where the scriptures reference God as actually being in a place, 
they substituted Shekinah there, for God is everywhere, not just in one place. And this quote is from the Dictionary of the Bible, 1902. The Shekinah is used in the Targums as the equivalent for the divine being, not for his glory. A good illustration of this occurs in Isaiah 60, where the Hebrew reads, The Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Targum renders, In thee the Shekinah of the Lord shall dwell, and his glory shall be revealed upon thee. In Isaiah 33, He dwelleth on high becomes, He has placed his Shekinah in the lofty heaven. In other words, Shekinah is never in either the English translation or the Hebrew Old Testament. Not even close. The Jews took and paraphrased. They added to the Word of God. And since they had the idea that God is everywhere, so God can't be in one place, let's put a substitute for God in a singular place. So they came up with Shekinah an emanation from God, a female emanation from God that shows up in a certain particular place. So the Jews substituting for God a mediatrix who was on the throne in the mercy seat in the most holy place. Are you kidding me? And one day it finally dawned on me where I had seen or heard of the word Shekinah from my childhood. Crystal City, Missouri and Festus, Missouri, they're, they're called the Twin Cities. They're like right next to each other. You could go from one to the other and not know it. Okay, that's how close they are. But in Crystal City, the main Freemasonic Lodge is in this area. It's for the Twin Cities, but it's in Crystal City, Missouri. And it's called, cue the music, the Shekinah Lodge. Dun, dun, da. There's their sign, and this is their Facebook page. Notice the symbol. That's the Eye of Ra. It's the Shekinah Lodge. That's where I heard it from. Then it clicked and it all made sense. And I have a lot more to show you on Shekinah. Now do that in the next Watchman video broadcast. You won't want to miss it. But I'm telling you, Shekinah is not the glory of God. Not even close. It's an abomination. Okay, not an emanation of God. Got a lot to talk about next time. You won't want to miss it. I hope you've enjoyed it. And wait for the cloud to move. Life will be so much easier if you do. All right? You're the reason why I do what I do. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.